Good evening. Let's worship and sing to the King. everyone tonight. A um, couple announcements. On the back table in the back room, um, it'll be there Sunday as well, but there's two new sign-up sheets, okay? There's obviously the VBS and the, the block party, those are still back there, but then the 15th, which is not this Sunday, but a week from Sunday, we're having another um, meal and game night. Now, the meal, we're going to do pizza, okay? So it'll be easy. 
easy sneezy pizza, right? Uh, but uh, five o'clock pizza and um, someone's asked about this weekend. Well, this weekend's Mother's Day, and so we're not having nobody come in for pizza. We're going to do the week after. So again, if you're wanting to come to that, sign up for that between now and this coming Sunday. Just make sure you get your name on the list so we have an accurate number for, for purchasing pizza. And then the other sign-up sheet is for the 21st. That's a Saturday, okay, a couple weeks away yet. But on that Saturday, we're having a cleanup streeter day. I don't know exactly what area. I know one time we hit the parks. Another time we went out, we started by by Walmart and RP Lumber, and we walked back, and we covered the main area. So, again, we'll figure out what area needs it, and we'll figure that out then. But, again, sign up for that on the 21st, and that will run from 9 a.m. until we'll try to end by noon, okay? So no more than about three hours. Um, and that, that's, that's really been a good amount of time, and we've covered a lot of ground, and it's, it's been a, a good thing we've done a, a couple times a year. Um, I think most people have been informed, but if you haven't heard, um, Nick Chamberlain passed away um, last night. And, um, and so be, in pr be praying for the Chamberlain family as they grieve the loss of Nick. And um, there will be a funeral service here on Saturday at 11 o'clock. Okay? There's not really going to be much of a visitation, uh, maybe a little bit before, but, um, but it's mainly just a funeral, and that'll be at 11 o'clock on Saturday. Okay? Um, I think that's all the announcements. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for the privilege of worshiping tonight, Lord, to pause midweek, to, to come together with fellow believers, to, to sing praises to your name, Lord, to, to, to pray and, and, and lift up concerns and and just glorify who you are, Lord, as, as King. Lord, I ask that you would be with us as we look at your word tonight. Help us to draw closer to you. Challenge us through your word tonight, Lord. Lord, we do pray for the Chamberlain family and who are grieving the loss of Nick, Lord. Lord, we rejoice that, that Nick is at home with you, that Nick has a new body and Nick is, is free of pain at this point, Lord. But we do ask that you would comfort the family who's grieving the loss, Lord. Comfort them these days, Lord. Lord, we ask you these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Tonight, um, if you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, um, we will be starting in verse 23, okay? And, and this passage of scripture is, is all about connecting between spiritual blessings and material blessings. Um, I was looking online and it talks about Throughout the years, there's been a lot of experts that, that supposedly were experts, right, who, who made a lot of mistakes. Um, let me give you some of those. In 1840, there was a transportation expert who, who wrote in a leading newspaper. He said, anyone who travels, I love this one, in excess of 30 miles an hour would surely suffocate from the speed. Shortly after, there was the train, which blew that away. In 1878, a, a leading scientist wrote, electric lights are unfeasible and not worthy of serious attention. Well, we know that was wrong, right? In 1901, a leading scientist wrote, no possible combination can be united in a practical machine by which men can ever fly. And within just a few months, you had the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Even in 1926, there was a leading scientist who wrote, it's foolish to consider shooting a man into, into space to the moon. That would be impossible. Well, we know that was, was not true. And then in 1930, another leading scientist wrote, to harness the energy locked up in matter is impossible. But of course, Einstein, he disagreed, and today we have nuclear energy. I say that all these things, I share these because experts are often wrong. Someone defined an expert as someone from out of town that carries a briefcase. I like that. Well, today, if you turn on the news or you listen to financial reports, there's a lot of financial experts, right, giving advice, telling you things you should invest in or things you should invest in. They, they, you, should, you should put all your money in the market. You should put none of your money in the market. There's all these different experts on TV telling you what you can do to increase your assets, right? And how you can take a little bit of money and you can make it grow. Everyone's got an idea for you. It's been said that, it's been said that, that leading experts of the world basically have the philosophy that, that you should get all you can. They say can all you get, sit on the can and poison the rest, right? Maybe you've heard that phrase before. They're saying basically get for yourself. 
you should accumulate, accumulate. You shouldn't worry about anybody else, right? Just take care of yourself. Keep accumulating. And, and I'm not saying, don't hear me say that you shouldn't save for the future, right? That you shouldn't, you shouldn't have a pension. You shouldn't look at or your 401k or whatever you choose to invest in. I'm not saying you shouldn't have those things. What I'm saying is you should examine your heart and your attitude about these things, okay? Look again at, at, at chapter 15 as we're going to start in verse 23. He writes, but now there is no more place. First of all, I'm sorry, back up. I know we covered these first couple verses last week. We're going to back up and hit them again as we go into the next, as we go in the next section here. Starting again, 23. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions. Again, he's meeting Greece or Corinth. And since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now pause there for a minute. Paul, he's in Corinth, in Greece, and, and, and kind of imagine, if you would, a map, okay? Even if you're not familiar with this area, he's wanting to go to Spain, okay? And, and on his way, he wants, to stop, he wants to stop by in Rome. And, and from Corinth to Rome, that's about 500 miles, okay? So he's going from here to here, about 500 miles. But instead of, of heading west, the next verse tells us he's going in the opposite direction. He's making a detour. And not just a little detour, not even a couple hundred miles. He's making a detour of a couple thousand miles in the opposite direction. So let's keep reading as we'll figure out why. Starting in verse 25, it says, um, Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received the contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Okay. Then, he, then he changes direction altogether, and he talks not only about a blessing, but he talks about a burden now. And So continuing on in verse 30, we'll read through the end of this chapter. It says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from, from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorable, re, favorably received by the Lord's people there so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. That's the end of the letter. That's the end of... of of the letter he's sending. Now, now you may say, wait a minute, wait, 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 you, you, it's not the end, there's a whole other chapter, right? That we, that's end of 15, but there's one more chapter left. And, and chapter 16 is kind of the PS, the postscript, okay? And we'll have two more messages on chapter 16, but, but the formal letter really ends in verse 15. And again, there's this little postscript we'll talk more about in the next couple weeks, and that'll, two more weeks, I think, and we'll wrap up Romans. But, but look again at, at verse 27. I want us to discuss this connection between spiritual blessings and material blessings. And then finally, the third point, we'll talk about this burden that's in the final verses of 15 as well. So first of all, I want you to consider spiritual blessings. Now stop for the moment and just, and just consider your spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1.3, Paul writes, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, tonight I want to share at least three spiritual blessings that each of us enjoy as Christians. If you're a Christian, first of all, you have received a new nature. You see, you were born with, with a sinful nature. You were born with a tendency and a propensity to sin. Have you ever noticed that, that no one ever has to teach a little child how to lie, right? You have to teach a child how to tell the truth, right? But you don't have to teach a child to, to tell a lie. You start lying naturally. 
Again, we have this, this nature towards sin. But when Christ, when he comes into our life, he gives us a new nature, a, a redeemed nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Well, here's blessing number two. If you're a Christian, you have received a new home. That's right. You, you received a home that is promised to you. It's called heaven. And, and while you're living on, on this planet Earth, for how many every years that, that God lets you live here, whether it's 70, 80, 85, 90, 100, whatever it is, it is temporary. When you look at this, this temporary home in, in light of eternity, it passes very quickly. Because the Bible says that we have an eternal home in heaven, not made by human hands, but made by God himself. Luke 10.20, Jesus made the, the remarkable statement. He said to his disciples, Do not rejoice because demons are subject to you in my name. Rather, hear this, he says, Rather rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. Rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. That's good news, folks. That's good news. If you're a Christian, if you've truly been born again, the moment that you received Christ, you know what happened? You, your name was written in that Lamb's book of life in heaven. That's your down payment. That's your reservation, your, your blessed assurance of a new home when you die. So here's blessing number three. When you become a Christian, you receive a new family. I mean, what, what do you mean a new family? Well, well, you see, we were all born into the wrong family. Let me explain that. People today often talk about the family of mankind on planet Earth as if, as if we're all one family, and, and that sounds good, but the truth is Jesus talks about there's two families, there, and there's two fathers. In John 8, Jesus said to some religious pagans, he said, you are, the, you are of the father, the devil, he tells them. But you, when you become a, a Christian, you change fathers and you change families. By, by new birth, you are part of a new family and, and you now have a heavenly father and you've got a bunch of, of brothers and sisters that you inherit as well. In John 3, 1, the Bible says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. What a privilege to be called children of God. In other words, when you become a Christian, you're, you're different, right? You're changed. You are a new person, a new creation. That's just three. I could go on and on. We could spend the whole evening talking about spiritual blessings that we have. But, but let's move on to our second part. The, the testimony of every Christian should be that we ought to be able to say, if Christ is in our heart, we are a new person. And, and then verse 27 goes on to talk about spiritual blessings that come from God. And because of that... Because we have these spiritual blessings, there's something we ought to do with our material blessings. Here's what we do. Second thing, we're not only to consider our spiritual blessings, but we're also to share our material blessings. It's saying if, if you've been blessed spiritually, you ought to be willing to share your material blessings. In the news, it's, it's common to hear people talk about a world economy, right? That we're moving toward, toward one economy, one monetary system. You don't take long to find that. It's, and it's not something new, is it? It's nothing new. All you have to do is read the book of Revelation. It talks about how the Antichrist is going to have one world government, one world economy. It's not something new. Tonight, I want to share something from the Word of God that's, that's much bigger than a global economy. I want to talk about God's economy. The Bible teaches that, that there is something about God's economy, and if you want to get, on what God, get in on what God is doing in this world, that you should understand God's economy. There's, there's three, three pillars to God's economy, and we are introduced to them through this discussion that, that Paul makes about financial, this financial offer and these material blessings. So, so here's the first pillar. All you have is a gift from God. That's your first pillar. Everything you have is a gift from God. You, you won't go any further until you understand that every material blessing you have came from God. It's easy to disagree with that. It's easy to say, well, I, I think I got everything the old-fashioned way. I inherited it, right? Or, or someone else would say, well, I worked for it. I went to school. I got an education. I worked hard, and by the sweat of my brow, I've earned it. Hear the key word in that statement? I, I, I. 
or is something I, I had done because I invested wisely through the years. Well, I want to call your attention to, to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, because if you think that is, is, is that what you have, that, that you've got it because of your own intelligence, look at this verse. And again, Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. You may say to yourself, my power and my strength of my hand have produced this wealth for me. Again, that's what the world teaches, right? Chapter, verse 18 says, But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Folks, anything that you've earned, God gave you the ability for that. God is the source of everything. By the way, this, this may change your whole perspective when you understand that every material and blessing in, in life comes from God. It may have came through a job, it, it may have come through other challenges, but it came from God. God is the source. It's not your job that's your source. It's not your investments. It's not an inheritance. It's, it's God who is your source, and, and that should change your perspective. Too many people are like the... the made up story of the little boy heading to Sunday school and his mom gave him two quarters and said, I get two quarters. One, you're to put in your Sunday school offering plate and, and the other one is for you to pick, get a piece of candy on your way home. And So the boy takes off with one in each hand and he doesn't go very far before he drops one and it goes down the sewer grade and he says, oh, too bad God, your quarter's gone. But in reality, that's what a lot of people are like. They think, well, well, I've got something, right? And, 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 and I've got others and and, and some of what I have, that, that I'm going to give that to God, right? Because I have this, and I'll, just, I'll take part of what I have, and I'll give it to God, because, because it's mine. Again, I'm giving some of it to God, but, but that's the wrong attitude. Because the truth is, it's all God's. It's all God's. He allows us to keep some of it. It's a reverse of how we often view it. We honor him by giving him the first and the best, not the leftovers. Let me call your attention to another scripture, 1 Corinthians 20, or 1 Chronicles 29, 12. When Solomon was dedicating the, the beautiful temple in Jerusalem that had been built by the sacrificial gifts of the people, this is what he says. Listen to this. He says, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Then it continue in verse 10, 14. It says, but who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. Now maybe you're wondering, wait a minute, how does this work? Because, because if God gives me what I have, then why does he want me to turn around and give part of it back? What's that all about? Why don't he just give me less and I not give part of it back, right? Well, let me share a couple of reasons. First of all, he commands it. And second, he wants it to use as a way to express love to him. Let me explain, explain it this way. Let me give you an illustration. When, when my kids were little, when they were really little, right, it came time for Christmas, and it was time to buy Christmas gifts, and, and they wanted to buy gifts for my wife and I and, and for each other, right? And, and so we would take them to the store, and we would give them money, right? And they would go around, and they'd figure out what they wanted to buy. And, and now, could I have taken that money and bought something for myself, picked something out? Absolutely, right? But I didn't. I gave them money and let them pick out a gift to give me. And so they bought this present, and on Christmas morning, I would open up the present, and I, I didn't say, you use my money to buy this, right? I open the present, and I receive it as a gift of love. It blessed my heart. I was pleased by what they had done. Now, if that's true of me, and I'm carnal, right? I'm a human father. How do you think our Heavenly Father feels when you, as his child, takes what he's given you and, and gives it back to him as an act of love? Again, it's a blessing unto God. Well, that's pillar number one. All that we have is a gift from God. Let me give you a financial pillar number two in God's economy. When you get, what you give is like a seed, but what God does with it is fruit. Look, look back at verse 28 again. He says, so I, after I have completed this task, and, and the task there is, ta is task about talking about taking an offering, okay? 
continue, it says, and have made sure that they have received this contribution. Now, many versions, depending on what you're looking at, it might say instead of contribution, it probably says fruit, okay, which I think is, is a better translation than, than the Bible I have right now. Fruit is a great translation there. He says, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. Folks, what, what God is interested in is the fruit that is produced by what we give or what we plant. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or, or under compulsion, for, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so then all things at all times, having all that you need, you will be abound in every good work. Paul is saying, if you've been blessed spiritually, and, and you have, that you should share material blessings as well. It's like planting seeds. Now, what can you do with seeds, right? You, you can do a lot of things, right? You can take your seed, and you can store it away. You, you, can, you can hoard it, right? You, you can stockpile your seed. and Keep it in the barns, right? Put it aside. And, and there's a lot of people who do just that with what God has given them. They store it. They save for a rainy day. Or you, you can eat it, right? Because it's edible, and, and that's that immediate gratification. In other words, you, you can spend what God gives you on yourself, and, and that's the end of it. Or you can also take that seed, and you can offer it into God's soil and plant it. And, and when you think you're letting go of it, actually what you're doing is investing in God's economy, and what comes forth is a harvest, fruit to the glory of God. So you see, when, when you, what you give is a seed that you plant, but what God does is produce a beautiful fruit from it. Here's the third pillar in God's economy. Unselfish giving brings more blessing. When you give unselfishly, when, when you plant a lot of seed, it brings more blessing. Let me, let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 again. Let's continue on in verses 10, 10 and 11. It says, Now he who supplies seed... Or you can substitute resources there, right? To the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now pause there for a minute. Who's the he? Is it the guy that runs the, the seed and feed store? Is it the grocer? Is it, is it your boss who writes your paycheck? No, it's, it's not the investment firm. It's God. God is the one who does that, okay? So he who supplies the seed. Keep reading in verse 11, it says, You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You'll be enriched in every way, meaning improved or enhanced. Now people think that, that rich means having a bunch of money and, and that's, that's only one way, right? He says you'll be rich in every way. Why? So you can spend it on yourself? No. So you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What Paul's talking about here is, is this beautiful pattern, a, a cycle that occurs. When you give, you plant a little seed, and then God gives a harvest. When you plant more seed, he gives a greater harvest. And, and then look back at, at verse 29 in our text again. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Do you want the full measure? I, don't even, I can't imagine anyone saying, well, I don't want the full measure of God's blessing, right? I want part of that, right? I want a quarter measure. No, you want the full blessing. The message is you can't outgive God. Now, hear me. Hear me say this. There's many people who have taken this principle and tried to manipulate it to their advantage. They tell people to, to give to their cause. Now, I will not say to their ministry because I wouldn't call what these people have ministries. But they, they say, if you, oh, if you give to, this, to give to this cause, then you'll be blessed financially, right? If you'll, if you'll give to us, then you'll be more blessed and you'll receive more money. So you give to receive money. Folks, that's a violation of God's principle. That's taking something that God says and twisting it and twisting and try to manipulate people to give to something that, that is not biblical. Okay? So we don't give to get financial blessing. Now, God may bless us financially. That may happen. But that's not why. That's not the reason to give. Does that make sense? You know a good definition of being rich? It's having all your needs met and having the capacity to enjoy life. Now, I know some people who have lots and lots of money. 
but I wouldn't count them rich by that definition because they don't have a relationship with God. They don't have a good relationship with their family. They're miserable people. They're, they're just not happy. And at the same time, I know people who don't have much money at all. And I would count them as wonderfully rich because they have their basic needs met and they're truly enjoying life. Each day they look forward to, they're enjoying their life. God says when you plant, there will be a harvest. So again, he he started off talking about spiritual blessings. He says, consider it. Then he moves to material blessings and he says, share it. And then number three, he says, share your burdens too. Because this passage also talks about not only blessings, but a burden that Paul had. And I want to focus on this just for a couple minutes. Look at verse 30. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Let's talk about what it means to, to share a burden with another. I'm glad the the Apostle Paul didn't write to them and say, well, I don't have any needs. I I don't need you to do anything. I've got it all under control. I'm handling it, right? Everything's just perfect. You know, the the infamous Christmas letter, right, that you get from some distant family members that tells you how perfect their life is. That's not the, the letter that Paul is sending out. He's saying, listen, hear me. I need you, and I need you to pray for me. Folks, there's power in praying for one another. You know why we all, we all need for each other to pray for us? Because first of all, life is a struggle. It's a struggle. Admit it. It's a struggle for everybody. We shouldn't deny it. Life's tough. It, it's a struggle. Even for the best of Christians, even for the strongest Christians, he says, I'm in a struggle. It's a struggle. It's why you need to share your burdens with each other. We shouldn't be ashamed to tell each other when we have a prayer need. It's it's a privilege to pray for each other. That's why we need to say, pray for me as I pray for you. Now, here's the second thing we learn about this. Even the strongest Christian needs prayer, and they should admit it. I consider the Apostle Paul one of the strongest Christians who ever lived. What a great testimony. And he's saying, I need you to pray for me. You, all, you and I also need to admit it. We need to admit that, that we need prayers from each other. Sometimes I'll ask, ask a Christian in our church, I'll, and sincerely ask, say, how can I pray for you? And usually they, they tell me some area to pray, but, but sometimes a person will say, well, that's all right. I, I don't really need any prayers. If someone says that to me, I, I think of one of two things is probably true. First of all, it's possible that, that they're spiritually lost, right? Or second, that they're in denial. Because Paul says, I need you to pray for me. I'm in danger when I grow to Jerusalem. I need you to pray for my protection. On the other hand, when when somebody asks me, say, say, Pastor, how can I pray for you? There's a person in this church who who every week either writes me or or calls me and asks me, how do our our Sunday morning says, how can I pray for you this week? What a privilege that is. and, And you can be there's so many things that are continual, right? Pray for, pray for me to have wisdom. Pray to me for, for, for physical strength. Pray for spiritual stamina. Pray for me to stay pure. And, and pray for me and my family that we can stay close to each other. I need your prayers. You need my prayers. We need to be praying for each other. Again, even the strongest Christian needs prayer. So we need to admit it as Paul did. And the third thing that we learn from what he writes, we need each other. For spiritual refreshment. We're coming to the end of this chapter. But look he says in in verse 32. So that I may come to you with joy by God's will. And in your company be refreshed. Refreshed. The same word refreshed that Jesus used in Matthew 11, 28. When he said come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Rest. Refreshment. That's what he's talking about. We come to Jesus for spiritual refreshment, but we come, we come to each other for emotional encouragement and refreshment. Folks, have you ever left church and felt low and, and more beaten down, more discouraged than when you came? If so, if that happened, if you came to church and, and you leave and more discouraged, more depressed than when you came in, then you left the exact opposite way that God intended for it to happen. 
And, and I should ask for forgiveness, right, as your pastor. If I preach sermons that are, that are, are beating you down then, and not encouraging you, I should ask for forgiveness because, because the Bible says that when we come together, we're to encourage one another and we ought to leave this place refreshed. Worshiping with you, just, just being able to share with you refreshes me. It's what the Bible says and why the Bible says that we need to, to do for each other, right? We need to encourage one, each other. Now, I, let me give a, a disclaimer to that. It's why you can't be a secret agent Christian. If you're not a Christian and you come to church, you shouldn't expect to be encouraged, to walk away encouraged always and, and positive and, and uplifted, right? Because if you're, if you're refusing to surrender your life to Christ, you may feel discouraged when you leave. It's, and that, that discouragement we would call conviction, right? If God is telling you you need to surrender your life to Christ and, and you're refusing to do that, there should be some discouragement in it. You shouldn't be comfortable with the things that are being said. There's a time where you need to give your life to Christ. It's why each week we have an invitation in this church. I, I typically share the Roman road, right? I talk about Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We, we talked about Romans 5.8, but God, God demonstrates his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And we talk about Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth and, and, and we believe with our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. And finally, Romans 10, 13, for whoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. It's a handful of verses, but I share those or, or other ones that are similar every Sunday because we give people that opportunity. That opportunity to commit their life to Christ. As we come to a close tonight, consider your spiritual blessings. Consider that you've received a, a new nature, an eternal home, a new family. And that we're, to, we're considering our spiritual blessings, but we're to share our material blessings. Now, some, are, some have a lot of material blessings, and they can share, and others very little. But that's okay. We just recognize that all we have is a gift from God. And when you give a seed, God blesses it as fruit. And selfless giving brings more blessing. And finally, again, we're to share our burdens. It's part of what Wednesday night is. In a moment, we turn off this camera we, we, and we go into a time of prayer. It's a time to pray for each other to encourage one another. If you're at home and you're watching this service, I know there's some people who can't get out on Wednesday nights, and that's fine. But you're missing, you're missing a blessing. You're missing a time where the church prays for one another. So I encourage you to come out on Wednesday night and join with us for this sermon and then this prayer time together. Be a part of what God is doing here. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, as we've walked through Romans, in just a couple weeks we'll be done after about 20 months of studying this book, Lord. There's been so many truths, Lord. But Lord, most of all, I pray for anyone who don't, doesn't know you, that as we share part of the book of Romans each week in our invitation, that you would use that to draw people unto you, that you would change hearts, that you'd bring more people into your kingdom as lives are changed, Lord. Thank you for allowing us, the, your church, to be a part of what you are doing, to the privilege we have to witness, the privilege we have to tell others the good news, the privilege we have to tell others our testimony about what you've done in our life and what you can do in their life, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we praise you this night. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
still and know you are God. When the oceans rise and the thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. I will be still and know you are God.